HMAS Sydney berths in Vung Tau Harbour, bringing another shipload of diggers for 12 months duty in Vietnam. After 12 more or less relaxing days aboard the troop carrier, the moment of expectancy arrives. Laden with combat and personal gear, the diggers move onto the flight deck to await their next means of transport, which will take them to their base 20 miles away at Nui Dat. Hello podcasters, welcome to Living History and thank you so much for the amazing response to last week's episode which was about Operation Sea Lion, the German plans to invade Britain during the Second World War. It generated a lot of conversation online, a lot of people were discussing whether Germany had the capability, a lot of people were asking why we even bothered to ask these questions of history, these what-if scenarios, but I think it was a really rewarding discussion. It's a really interesting what if scenario? Could the Germans have invaded the UK had they won the Battle of Britain? So thanks to everyone who contributed to the discussions around that. This week, I'm delighted to bring you this podcast because as part of my job, I'm very, very fortunate that I get to speak to a lot of veterans. I don't just get to walk the ground and I don't just get to read all the history books. I get to speak to veterans who were there during these incredible conflicts. And so what I've decided I'm going to do is I'm going to start interviewing them and I'm going to put those interviews into a podcast so today, this is the first of these veterans interviews, and what a great one it is to kick off with. It's Gary Mackay, who was a lieutenant during the Vietnam War. He was a platoon commander. He's a dear friend of mine. I've known him for many years. I've walked the ground at Vietnam with him, and Gary's story is just incredible. He commanded a platoon in South Vietnam in 1971, and he led that platoon in the last major operation Australians participated in during the Vietnam War. That was the Battle of Nui Lai in September 1971. During that action, we lost several diggers. Gary himself was very badly wounded. And afterwards, he won the Military Cross for his bravery and for his leadership during that uh, that battle. It was the last Military Cross awarded to an Australian because soon after that, we adopted uh, our own system of awards and the British system went by the wayside. So it was the last Military Cross awarded to an Australian and very deservedly so. Gary's accounts of what went on during the Battle of Nui Lai are just, just spine-tingling. So it was a real privilege to sit down and speak to Gary about his, his experiences in Vietnam, and I'm really enjoying bringing this to you. So I hope you enjoy hearing from Gary as much as I did. So here he is, Gary Mackay, talking about his time in Vietnam. A date which will live in infamy. That's one small step for man, one well, may we say, God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terror attack. This was their final tower. Gary, it's a real privilege to be sitting here talking to you about your experiences in Vietnam. Um, before we get into that, why don't we start? It's the late 60s in Sydney. You're a young bloke. Um, the Vietnam War had been going on for quite a while by this stage. Was the war a major element in your life as a young bloke living in Sydney? Was it something you ever felt there was a danger of you being caught up in or was it just some distant event that you didn't um, you know, pay much attention to? I, um, it was in the background. I was uh, living on the northern beaches, um, rugby union, surfboat rowers and the pursuit of females was my main endeavour. I was a trainee computer programmer at the AMP Society at Circular Quay and I really didn't think about it until my draft notice, my, my call up for conscription came and I had to register for national service. Then it came into focus but it wasn't until I was you know, in late 19 years of age, almost 20, um, when I did get called up, that's when I started to pay attention. Until then, I didn't even know where Vietnam was. I didn't know it was in the Northern Hemisphere. You know, I did not. I didn't care. You know, it wasn't going to happen to me, but it did. You hadn't did had any of your workmates from the AMP or any of your friends from school or anything gone to Vietnam at that stage? Yes, uh, a couple of guys from my high school had, but they joined the regular army, and. Where I worked at the AMP, the lady who was my direct supervisor, her brother was wounded 
in Vietnam with one RAR on their first tour of duty. So that sort of struck home. I was only about 17 when that happened. So, yeah. So then I started to pay attention. What was your attitude to the whole conscription um, situation at that time? Um, when my marble came out with my birth date on it, um, then I realised just how unfair this system was because it was a raffle. It was a big lottery um, based on birth dates because the Australian government couldn't afford to conscript everybody, um, so that it had to be a, a ballot. And uh, that cheesed me off, you know, that it was just chance that you went in. And, uh, and I was due to go to the United States and, and do a uh, senior programming course. I've been selected for that and never got there because conscription got in the way. Did you watch the conscription ballot that yeah. well, your number came out on TV? Did you actually see it live when it came out? I didn't see mine come out, but I'd seen other ones where they, they ran the meat raffle ball and away they went. Uh, yeah, no, I saw I saw it being done by the Department of Labor and National Service on television, but I didn't see mine. The first thing I knew about it, I was living at Newport, uh, but the mail went to my mum and dad's place in Pimble, and uh, so that's where the envelope was delivered. What year is this? 1968. Okay, so you're conscripted all of a sudden? Yep. And now you find yourself in, in the army. How long between being advised that you'd been conscripted and actually turning up for your first day in the army? How long was that? Well, you got it. Um, you got the letter to go to York Street in Sydney to do your medical, and that was sort of like around January, February, and then our intake was on the 1st of May. So it was three or four months. So I competed in the Australian Surf Boat Championships in South Australia and then I went on a two-week surfing safari and then had a haircut and then I reported into Marrickville Depot and they gave me another haircut and then away I went. So what was that whole process like, going pretty instantly from a laid-back surfer civilian to being in the Army? It was a um, bit of a shock. I mean, I'd done some CMF training, um, now known as the Army Reserve, and that was in a failed endeavour to get out of doing national service. But it cheesed me off so much, and it interfered with my rowing and rugby commitments so much that I ended up chucking it in and thought, oh, I'll take my chances, and that failed. Um, it was it was still it was a lot different to the reserve or to the CMF when you got sucked into the big green machine. So tell me about your training. You arrive, turn up, haircuts. What now? <laughs> oh, we're at Marrickville and uh, it was an old recruitment depot anyway, you know, in the Second World War and all that. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of guys there and um, they gave us a, a very quick cursory medical. They jabbed us in the arm, gave us a haircut and... And a, and a folder with all of our details in it. And, we, and you had to carry that around because it had on it your number. And you had to remember your number. And um, uh, then I thought I would be going from Sydney to Singleton to the 3rd Training Battalion, but that was full. And so they put us all on a bus, several buses, three busloads, I think, and they sent us to Puckapunyal in Victoria in May and we didn't have the cool weather clothing that we really needed. And we, we, we overnighted to uh, Pucker, which was an exciting trip because our bus driver fell asleep at the wheel and we ran off the highway and into the bush. And no one got hurt, but the bus did. And we had to transfer everyone onto the other two buses. And I spent the rest of the journey, a couple of hundred k's, sitting in the wheel well of the bus. <laughs> yeah, on the stairwell, sorry, not the wheel well, the stairwell of the bus. And uh, Ian arrived there at uh, um, early morning, very early morning, and people started yelling at us and calling us germs and slovenly civilians. And, and we got marched off to our barracks and told to get into greens. And So it was just a procession then of being issued kit for the first couple of days. As training went on, you got flagged for potential mm. officer skills. Yes. Tell they, me about that. They they took us all to the big assembly hall and uh, there were about a thousand guys, I reckon, in the hall. Um, 
and they showed this uh, movie on uh, the officer training unit Skyville out near Windsor. And uh, the movie show was, it looked like it had been made by Goebbels or someone. You know, it was just lies. And um, But it painted this really rosy picture of Skyville and training and becoming an officer and blah, blah. Um, and they said uh, you needed to have matriculated and passed the medical and the psych test. Put up your hand, yeah, so... And my dad said, if you get offered it, go for it. So I did. And uh, so then about 300 of us got through to the selection board process and you spent a whole day going through this very intensive uh, procedure, which is still in use today because it works, and they selected officer candidates out of that. And out of that 300, probably about... Probably about 50 made it through the selection board. So after two weeks, I was then shoved onto a, uh, an aircraft and uh, flown up to my first flight in a plane, uh, flown up to Sydney and then by bus out to Skyville. I'd only been in the Army 14 days at that stage. And what was the officer training like when you got there? Not uh, Apparently not like it was in the video? No, total fabrication, that video. Um it was, I guess the best way to describe Skyville, it was, it was a pressure cooker because they had to inject into us um, all, of the, all of the elements that were going to make us a young infantry. The exit point was you had to be capable of leading an infantry platoon in South Vietnam against the Viet Cong. That was the exit point. So it was very narrow. And... Everything was designed towards that. It wasn't about being a great drill expert. It wasn't. It was about being able to lead a rifle platoon in South Vietnam, and it was a pressure cooker. It was uh, the, your day started at um, six in the morning and went through to about half past nine at night. Um, lectures after dark uh, for a couple of hours, and full on during the day, just full on. And everything you did, from physical training to your exams, your tests, everything was assessed. Even playing sport, the way you conducted yourself in the cadets' mess, everything was assessed. And, uh, for example, uh, my class had 135 start, I think, and about 53 graduated. So there was a there was a high attrition rate because... They just needed to weed out anyone that wasn't going to cut the mustard. I guess by this stage, they'd learn a lot. They, you know, Australia had been fighting in Vietnam for quite a while now. Well, did you find that the officer training related very specifically to the experiences that other officers had had in, in early rotations in Vietnam? Absolutely. The See, what they were doing, they were condensing the 12-month Portsy, Officer Cadet School Portsy course, into six months. So they, all the extraneous nice bits, it was the must-haves. And all of the instructors had been hand-picked and they were all Vietnam veterans, all of them. And everything, I don't know how many times a day you'd hear it, but you'd hear an expression like, if you don't do this, your men will die or someone will get badly hurt. Or if you don't pay attention, you'll miss out on the essential elements that you'll need to survive on the battlefield. Everything was about that, absolutely everything. So it focused you, really focused you. Um, some guys hated it, um, but the physical and mental challenge of it, for me, I enjoyed immensely. I really did. Um, and so did other guys that I've spoken to since. Um, it, it was, they took our blinkers off. They Emotionally, mentally, physically, they took our blinkers off and made us aware of what we were physically and mentally capable of. How was that feeling that you're constantly being reminded that within a short period of time, you're going to be in the jungle, you're going to be under fire? How, how did that feel, noting that, you know, oh, only six it, months earlier you'd been working the AMP? It grabbed your attention. I mean, every afternoon we walked into the cadet's mess and it had already been named the Gordon Sharp Memorial Mess and because he was the first national serviceman killed in Vietnam at the Battle of Long Time. So, yeah, when you walk through that portal every single night to go and have dinner, 
you were being reminded that this is for real. What uh, what sort of skills you said that they were they were equipping you with all the skills you needed to lead a platoon in Vietnam? What sort of skills were they specifically training you during that course? Well, apart from the basic infantry uh, tactics, um, see, once you've been there three months, you're all, you were qualified to be a corporal, a junior leader. Um, but they taught us everything from infantry minor tactics to all of the other skills that we were going to need. Remember in Vietnam, how to call in and adjust artillery fire, navigation field craft, battle craft, weapon handling, and not just your own weapon, all of the weapons that would be in your platoon. And that ended up saving my life, uh, as it turned out later. Um, but leadership was a big thing. Um, you were constantly being put in positions where you had to lead others, whether it be on a navigation exercise or a, you know, a camouflage thing where you had to use camouflage concealment and movement to attack a target like a land stalk for example sounds silly but it works um everything that that would you would need to be able to do it and the biggest thing i think was decision making because they would always ask when you're out in the field and you're in the command position they'd say what are you going to do now platoon commander and you had to make a decision because if you didn't and you faltered and you and you ginned around, that's when people get hurt. So it was all about doing very quick mental appreciations. You had to know all of your equipment, but you had to also know the enemies, the ranges of the enemy weapons, because these are all combat indicators. And uh, yeah, it was very focused. Did you feel... By the time you arrived in Vietnam, and we'll get to that in a minute, your experience of arriving in Vietnam, but did you feel that the training was adequate for what you would then experience in the jungle? Well, I, I didn't go for a, a good two years because I, I was posted to the 3rd Training Battalion at Singleton and I should have only been there in a holding pattern until going to the infantry centre at Ingleburn. But I was the captain of the rugby team. So the, the bastards kept me there. And then as soon as we won the grand final in the Hunter Valley competition, I got posted, you know. But, and by that stage, I've only got about six months left in the army in the two-year conscription. So I've done all this training and the best part was when I was at Singleton, we were training recruits and core trainees. And all of my staff, all of my NCOs and all of the other senior officers in that unit were Vietnam veterans. So I had an extra year of training almost. So by the time I got to Vietnam, I felt more than ready. And when I joined the 4th Battalion, prior to going to uh, Vietnam, uh, it was the same thing again. All of, the, all of the senior officers in the battalion had been to Vietnam. The only guys who hadn't were all the lieutenants. We hadn't been. All of our senior NCOs had been. And in my platoon, four of my soldiers had been to Vietnam. So where did you meet up with your platoon for the first time? <laughs> oh, dear. I was uh, supposed to uh, go to the reinforcement wing, but I was the adjutant came in as I was literally packing my bags and said, um, when you drive down the highway, turn left at Canungri, you're going to join the 4th Battalion. So I actually joined my platoon going through the battle efficiency course at Canungri. I hadn't even met him. And... Uh, and I got thrown into that. The worst part of that was that the platoon sergeant I initially had didn't want to go back. And he was he was like an ashtray on a motorbike. He really was. He was useless. And he didn't want to play anymore. And so I was trying to do everything and screwing it up, trying to do the admin and be the leader. In the end, the staff just said, just worry about leading. We'll take care of the rest. Um, and so that's where I got to meet my platoon. And um, we did we did that six weeks at, on the battle efficiency course um, where I was very closely looked at by the instructors, by everyone else. You know, my own platoon staff were looking at me very carefully. Um, uh, but I got through that, and then um, and then there was a rejiggling of uh, people because my the, the sergeant got the sack, 
reduced to the ranks, uh, or reduced to corporal, and one of my senior corporals got promoted to sergeant. So we then didn't go until uh, the next April, April, May, yeah, April. Just talk us through, for, for people listening that, that aren't aware, what was the structure of your platoon? How many men were in it? What sort of weapons did you carry? What specialisations okay. did each men have? Um, well, one and 34. One officer, 34 other ranks, basically, more or less, and that, that varied a little bit. But um, the platoon was broken up into three rifle sections. Each rifle section commanded by a corporal, a lance corporal second in command, who is also the platoon uh, grenadier. He carried the grenade launcher. Um, and then, so a corporal and nine riflemen in a section. In that section, we had a machine gun group, so uh, the GPM GM60, and a number one and number two on the gun. Four riflemen carrying the 7.62 millimetre SLRs, and the section commander. Uh, and the two scouts, two rifle scouts in the section would carry M16s. Um, in platoon headquarters, uh, the platoon commander, a second lieutenant or a lieutenant, a platoon sergeant. And um, when we went to Vietnam in 1971, uh, we actually had two signalers. We had uh, the platoon SIG and the second one carried a reserve Radio uh, radio set, and he was my Batman orderly, runner, gopher, coffee maker, whatever. Um, and that that was very good because it allowed us to split the platoon if we needed to. Um, but uh, they were the principal things. The uh, halfway through our tour, the M seventy nine grenade launcher was replaced with the M two hundred three under and over M sixteen two and M seventy nine put together. Uh, no instruction book, I might add, but we learned how to use it. But the GPM GM60 um, was a damn good machine gun for Vietnam. The SLR wasn't; it's not a. Well, it shouldn't have been a jungle weapon, but we we carried it. But we would I would have rather carried an AK-47 to be honest, um, because the Owen gun and the and the F1. Um, they just lacked punch. They were 9 mil, but they lacked punch. Whereas the AK did, with the 7.62 short, it, it could punch through the bush. Yeah. Um, how did the platoon take to having their new green sergeant, fresh out of uh, green lieutenants, fresh, fresh out of training? How did the uh, platoon respond when you arrived? Well, the reason I was there was that the previous one had been sacked for incompetence. So they were looking on with... Uh, jaded eyes I think um, but the first thing I said to my platoon sergeant and I'd been told to do this when I was at Skyville was um, make friends with your platoon sergeant and uh, I very quickly um, because I when my old one got the sack I then brought up a bloke called Daryl Jenkin to be my sergeant Daryl and I very quickly um, formed a good working relationship. Um, he, because I would always listen to what he had to say, because he'd done, he'd been in the same platoon since it was formed in 4RER. He'd been to Borneo, Malaya, and a tour of Vietnam with 11 platoon. And he'd come through the ranks. He knew what was going on. And so I listened to what he had to say. Um, before going out on operation, I'd make up my orders and then I'd call Daryl into my tent and I'd say, this is what I'm going to say. And he'd listen to what I had to say and I'd say, feedback, and he'd say, well, this, this, this and this. And they would always be fine tuning points that made things work. But it didn't take long for him to realise that I could do the job. Um, of course, it was all going to be put under the hammer once we got into battle. So tell me about travelling to Vietnam. You went on the Sydney, I think you you said you, you all travelled on the Sydney? World's slower ship, yeah. The HMAO Sydney, it picked us up because we were in Townsville as part of uh, the Laverack Barrack group and uh, we were picked up by uh, um, landing craft and driven out to the uh, HMAO Sydney and then um, 
the the advance party had gone about a week before that by air uh, from Townsville, and then we took ten days to steam up in this ship designed for the North Atlantic <laughs> through the tropics. Oh, God, it was hot. Um, I was saved because um, I'd done a marksman coaching course and I was a battalion shooting coach. And so I got the job of running rifle shooting off the back of the ship. So every day was a fun day for me. I didn't have to do all the other normal rubbish that other people got stuck with, giving lectures and lessons to diggers that just wanted to get to the wall, you know. Um, so I was doing the shooting and, and that, that went pretty well. So that's, But every day, you know, you go and do lessons and on the uh, the um, rule the order the rules of law um, the standard operating procedures you just go through them time and time and time again um, and until we arrive there first aid revision and and basic basic Vietnamese um, just yeah stop hands up hello goodbye and all that sort of stuff. What was the feeling among the men heading over about how the war was going and what your role was going to be in it when you got over there? We knew by the time we sailed that this was a lost cause. We knew. Um, Vietnamization had been started by the Americans the year before, um, in, in the beginning of 1970, late 69, 70. We knew that this this wasn't going to be a war like to end like the Second World War or whatever. Um and Daryl and I very quickly um, agreed that our role when we went to Vietnam was to return with as many of our platoon alive as possible. We weren't there to defeat the Viet Cong and every, yeah, sure, kill the enemy so they don't kill you. That was that was it. Um, we knew that we weren't going there to win the war. We knew it. Um, but we were going there to do a job, and that was our job. Really, was to help the South Vietnamese. How do you be motivated to go off and fight in this war that you think's a lost cause? That you know that you know you're not going to have any material effect in victory. That you're basically just there to try and get out of it as best you can. How do you how do you motivate? How do you stay motivated to get over there? How do you motivate a platoon to go and fight? You didn't have to. It was called testosterone. No, they were they were just like any other young diggers going off to the First World War, the Second World War. It was an adventure. Um, guys guys pulled out of whatever they were doing in civilian life and 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 sent off. And you've got to remember that half of the platoon were regular soldiers and the other half were conscripts. But you couldn't tell the difference, to be honest. The training was exactly the same. And and they they melded as one. And um, no it was a self motivating thing. Um, I'm going to a war zone, I don't want to get killed, I will work to the best of my ability with my team. Whether it be your gun team, your rifle team, your scout team, your platoon, your company, it didn't matter. Everyone was focused on the one thing, doing the job to the best of their ability. What were the first impressions when the platoon made it to Vietnam? Where did you go when you first got there and, and what was the impression when you uh, as soon as you'd arrived? Well, we, we arrived in Vung Tau Harbour where we anchored for the night and all night the Navy ran around dropping scare charges around the side of the ship to stop Viet Cong sappers from putting limpets on the vessel. And then the next morning we went up onto the flight deck and rode in a Chinook helicopter, American Army Chinook helicopter, for the first time. And then we flew up to our base in Nui Dat. It's about a 30-minute flight. And as you look out the windows, the whole countryside is pockmarked with craters and we you know, very quickly realised, oh, I'm in a war zone. And it was stinking hot and it was very humid. Even though we'd come from Townsville, it just seemed to have gone up a couple of notches. And uh, everywhere you look, people are in green baggy skin and armed. Everywhere you looked, you know, and all of a sudden, I'm in a war zone. Welcome to the war. Yeah, so first impressions was it was hot. Hume was like having a big hot wet blanket thrown over you. And now it's for real. Um, everything was full on once we arrived. What was Nui Dat like? I mean, the base had been running for years by this oh. stage. And what was it like when you got there? Oh, very sophisticated. Uh, um, a runway that could take uh, CC-08 or Caribou or C-123 provider aircraft 
I think you could put a Herc down there if you really wanted to. It had helicopter landing pads. There were permanent buildings there, single story, um, uh, corrugated iron buildings with blast walls around each one. All the tents had blast walls around them, made out of sand, you know double layer sandbags. We had fighting pits. We had perimeter wire minefields. Um, you manned machine gun posts at night on your perimeter. Um, it was just like a small. It was a small town of five thousand people. How long were you there before your first patrol? About ten days, I reckon. Um, the first thing we did, we they just had to refocus us on everything to do with war fighting. Because in Australia, everything we did was within Australian safety distances. Well, they just disappeared. Um, I always remember uh, get it, sitting in there and this helicopter gunship pilot walked in and there was a thing on the side of the wall saying minimum safety distance from forward line of own troops. And it had, you know, for napalm, for bombs, for rockets, and, that, and it had minigun. And it had 25 metres and this, he just walked up and he crossed it out and he wrote 23 and that sort of got our attention and um, and the way we called in artillery the procedures would change slightly because you needed to get on target quicker instead of calling the first round 400 metres out it all came back a lot further and uh, so we had a lot of reorientation we had more refresher skills on um, the rules of engagement which were hammered into you day and night um, we we fight, we did a final zero of all our weapons. We actually went out and called for an adjust fire with the new system, using different artillery pieces as well and mortars, um, just so we could get used to the sound of what it was like a lot closer to. Um, and then we went out on a warm up operation into an area that is allegedly free of enemy. For us, it was free of enemy. For some others, no, they're into it as soon as they land it, you know. But uh, but for us, we shook down and we called for a fire and we married up with APCs and tanks and did all that stuff. Only for about uh, 10 days and then we came back, had about another three or four days in base and then we're away. So talk to me about patrolling. I mean, this is the basis of, of the Australian operations in Vietnam. It was all about patrolling. Just ex- explain the patrolling, what you were trying to achieve, how long you were out for, how you conducted your mission when you were out there. How did it all work? Okay. Uh, when we were back in Nui Dat, um, you get the, the word to uh, report to the company commander and take orders for the next stop. Now, those orders were only covered the first couple of days to get you in. And the company would deploy by either walking out of the base, which was rare, um, or going out in the back of trucks with centre seating, armoured personnel carriers, or more commonly, flying out in Iroquois. And we would deploy away from the base, but we'd always be within range of 105 artillery because they had fire support bases established around the place. But in 1971, the task force had been reduced from three battalions to two. So we had a lot more dirt to cover. We had half of the province, which is 60 by 60 k's, roughly, roughly, of sort of patrolling area. Consequently, when we went out on an operation, we normally went out for a minimum of two weeks, but more commonly for six and every five days, we would be resupplied by chopper. Wait, just to say that again, six weeks? Six weeks. In the jungle? In the jungle, yep. And and that wears you out uh, because of the sleep patterns you establish. Because you, you'd never go out with 34 men or 35 men. You'd go out with 28 or 30 because you still had to defend the perimeter. You still had guys who couldn't go for some reason or other. They might have upper respiratory tract infection, they are coughing and carrying on. Or a guy might have been injured, like spraining an ankle or a knee, playing footy or whatever, or tripping over a log. There'd be always some reason. And 
And so consequently your 10-man rifle seconds were usually only eight, eight to nine tops. And so you, instead of having two scouts, you might only have one in the rear sections. So we would deploy into an area, uh, get off the choppers, let's say we go by helicopter, get off the choppers, and each platoon will be allocated an area of operations. And that might be 10 grid squares. And you would always have a 500 metre buffer to your boundary so you didn't have an accidental clash. And then it was up to you as the platoon commander to decide, how am I going to search that ground? And in the dry season, um, no self-respecting Viet Cong would be more than 30 foot off the, the water level from a creek line. So we used to search the riverine. We'd do a riverine type search, you know, following the water courses and that, looking for enemy camps. So this is the, this is the idea of the patrol, is to go out, find the enemy, engage them, destroy if them. If we didn't have a specific yeah. target, it would be a search and clear operation, or if there was a target, a search, fix and destroy, or search and destroy uh, operation. Other operations might be um, we need to check out that village because we suspect that there are bad guys there, and we do a cordon and search. So you cordon the village and then search it the next morning and stop anyone getting in or leaving. Um, so they're all different types of, of operations. But generally, it was a search and destroy was the more common. And we would, we used to, because our role was to close with, find and fix and then kill the enemy, destroy the enemy. That was it. It was as simple as that. And... Um, we would always be looking for tracks, sign, any sign that the enemy had been in the area. And these were what we call free fire zones, where there were hardly any civilians in the area at all. It was, they're just hunting grounds, and that's what we do. And at the end of uh, the time that you'd finished searching that, if you found sign, for example, you'd stop and you'd put in a, an ambush, overnight ambush. What kind of sign would that be of enemy activity? Footpads, uh, staging camps. Um, anything at all where they had been moving, resting and moving on as they transited through your area. And and if you just had, you know, a six grid square area, sometimes we just do a box search, just scribe a large box, a big rectangle or a square, and sooner or later you're going to cut, cut their track. And then you'd either follow that up or ambush that track. What were the enemy trying to achieve as they were moving around in these in these zones? They were moving from point to point to strengthen their own numbers, uh, to carry out attacks on the local regional force and popular force, South Vietnamese uh, militia, because they were soft targets. Um, they learned very quickly not to attack major bases because that, they just couldn't win that. Uh, they had no air support, and we did. So they, they had to move, usually by night, very late in the afternoon, early in the morning, um, or do their operations under cover of darkness. Um, so that's what they were doing. They were also recruiting people. They were harassing and intimidating villagers to give them food, give them money, give them support, uh, or they'd terrorise them, and uh, terrorism was their primary weapon. Was this Viet Cong or not? Yes, Viet Cong. Cong. Viet Cong. Yeah. Okay. What was your first experience of combat like? <laughs> yeah. Um, patrolling through southern part of the province. Um, we'd found a bit of sign in the form of a footpad, but the sign wasn't fresh. And um, so we were very carefully moving down an old timber track that was overgrown. Saw a crashed helicopter, been there for about eight years, I reckon. Um Nothing had been moving around that. And as we were moving along, um, we heard movement. So we just stopped uh, and the enemy blundered into us uh, because it was thick. They were moving through thick jungle, but they were using an American compass to, lead, to find, you know, to beat their path. So they walked into us and we into them. And uh, we went into our normal contact drill and... Um, all of a sudden it went quiet and I realised everyone was looking at me saying, what are you going to do now? And I went, ah, oh, it's my turn. And because I'd just been 
amazed to watch the guys running into the contact, dropping their packs and going forward aggressively and um, putting a fire base down and then it was my job, okay, we'll do a left hook and away we went and um, I think we only got one that day. Yeah, only got one of those guys and the other three took off. But left a blood trail. We did a quick search out, then secured it, secured that dead soldier, um, stripped him, looked looked for any intelligence we could, information, and then buried him. And then, yeah, but it was short and sharp and violent and noisy. It was the noise that was the big thing because, you know, we were ear protection and uh, it's going off everywhere, you know. Yeah. It takes a while for your heart to come back to normal again. How was it, uh, how was your experience of combat now that you'd been in it compared to all the training and everything you'd been told? What was it like to actually be there when the bullets were flying? It was, it showed how good our training was um, because, I mean, people were running into the contact. They were going forward into the contact, like they're running into danger. But it's the best way to, it's the best way to achieve victory is to, and success is to dominate the enemy. And that aggressive always going forward using fire and movement is pretty daunting, you know, if someone's coming at you like that. Yeah. What was the experience like? I mean, we'll get to some more of the, obviously, the action that you went through, but just this idea of patrolling and being out there for weeks at a time. I mean, you and I have been into this jungle in Vietnam together. You know, we, we probably spent an hour or so blundering around in that jungle, whatever we were doing. Um, we came out of it and we were... You know, we were scratched, we were bleeding, we had leeches stuck all over us. You know, I think we'd both fallen down at least a couple of times. I mean, this is unforgiving, terrible, terrible country. Mm. How was it to say, to be in the middle of that for six weeks? I mean, putting aside the, the fact that you could come in contact with the enemy and have to fight a battle, how was it just living and sleeping and trying to survive in this oppressive jungle? Well, you've got to remember... The oldest man in my platoon was 26. We were, most of my soldiers were 20 or 21. I was 23, just turned 23. Um, we were extremely fit. Um, we carried no weight. I had Feltex, underfell, on the inside of my web belt so it didn't chafe my then skinny waist. Oh, I dream of those days. But we were very fit. And we were carrying, you know, 25 kilos on our backs, average, I guess. Um, and we were moving between 8 to 10 kilometres a day at a steady, you know, kilometre an hour rate, roughly, um, where you're listening and stopping and hot, always on the alert. Um, it was a set routine. And you might do a whole week and find nothing. But you never know when it's going to be because there was no front line. It's all around you. So you got into that routine and every hour we'd stop, send a location state on the radio or a lockstat, rotate the lead section and the next lot of scouts would take us out on the bearing that we need. It was all about paces and bearings. You couldn't... You couldn't do a resection by a compass to a geographical feature because all you saw around you was green, just trees and jungle. And you just got into that routine. Um, and you'd always, we'd always look ahead on the map and you've seen the picto maps that I've shown you with the photographs. So you knew if there was a change in vegetation coming up or there might be a small hamlet somewhere on what to look for. So there was always something coming up. And you got into that routine. It was, and you were wet with, with sweat from about eight o'clock in the morning until you stopped that night, every single day. And sometimes you got rained on. What about sleeping? What did you do at night time? Well, um, at night, once we, we'd stop about four o'clock in the afternoon because it'd be dark by six, we'd, everyone, we'd have a feed, we'd cook a feed. If we hadn't had any contact, we would cook a meal. If we had had a contact, we'd eat cold. Um, not to give our position away by the smell of cooking. Then about half an hour before 
um, it, we started to lose light. We would move again from where we'd stopped and we'd do a hook and go into an all-round defensive position, what we call a platoon harbour. And then we'd man three machine guns at night on a staggered picket. So two men on, staggered, and platoon headquarters would man the radio in the middle. And um, we would have comms scored between the sections inside the perimeter. Whoever was on the uh, shit list, as we called it, for screwing up, would have to dig the platoon toilet in the middle of the platoon. And we would have sentries out in front of the guns. In front of each gun also, we'd put a bank of claymores on any likely approach. Explain for us the well, about the claymore, because this is an essential... The claymore, the M18A1 claymore mine was an anti-personnel mine. It was directional. It had uh, uh, a pound and a bit of uh, high explosive in it with 500 steel ball bearings, and it sat on a set of tripod legs or two sets of legs. It was a... You could either electrically detonated or or it could be done through uh, instantaneous fuse. And it, it had a uh, very good uh, killing arc out to the front. Anything within five metres, you would tear the clothes off people with it. It would hit between the, the knees and the shoulders, but on an angle of about uh, 50 degrees. So... Yeah, and you could link them together, so they all went off together, so you, with overlapping arcs. An anti-personnel device, um, and that was just to protect yourself. And if you needed to do a fighting withdrawal, you would wait until the enemy closed up to those claymores, fire them, and then bugger off. But, um, and that was the general... And then, first thing in the morning, disarm the claymores. One of the sections would go out in front, and we'd sweep around the whole position and make sure the enemy hadn't come up during the night or we hadn't missed something when we went into our night defensive position. And then uh, we'd pick up, move, stop, have breakfast, clean weapons, and we'd clean our weapons twice a day. And that's always a staggered drill, so you haven't got all your weapons down at once and only ever one gun at a time. And then, um, and then into your daily routine. So from about... Nine o'clock in the morning until four o'clock, you're doing steady patrolling. You might even start before nine, might be eight. But, you you know, it's sun up to sundown um, was your, your awaking day. So about 12 hours of daylight. It's pretty gruelling stuff. And you mentioned before this idea of pacing and, you know, direction pacing to, to, to work out where you were going. And I've spoken to veterans before that have talked about this. I mean, it was really specific, wasn't it? I mean, this was something that surprised me that I didn't know how specific it was counting out your paces and checking oh, yeah. cups bearings. Just talk, talk us through that. Well, we were issued with um, sheep counters, you know, that stockies use. Um, and we had them fixed onto the stock of of the, of the of a weapon and just one with duct tape, you know, black duct tape. And the, the, the figure that we used to calculate 100 metres, because everything was in metres and all our bearings were in mils, was it was 110 paces to 100 metres on flat ground with your pack on. And it was very accurate. And uh, you would set a bearing, and let's say we're going due north, so you're going 6,400 mils. And we've got to, you've got to remember, you had to have you had to make adjustments between the bearings that you're taking with your compass and then figuring it out on the map because of magnetic variation. But that's a bit too tech. So let's go on 6,400 mils and we're going to do that for an hour. And away we go. Now, the, the lead section commander, he'd, he'd have a look at his compass and he'd look into the distance and see a point and the scouts would set off. And every now and then they'd turn around and just glance and he'd, he'd just give a left or right with his head or point to bring them back online and away we'd go. And that was done in every section. They were counting the paces and the attachments to the platoon were usually the forward observer's assistant, a bombardier from the direct support battery. Um, his job was not to look out for enemy. His job was to navigate. So he was our, 
our serious check navigator. And when we would go for an hour, we'd stop. The section commanders would come into the centre where I was and we'd do a straw poll. Okay, what'd you get? And they'd say, oh, 900, 850, 920. And we'd average that out, get a figure. Then I'd turn to the bombardier and say, how many paces? And he'd give me the exact number. And it was always spot on. Because this is pretty essential, isn't it? You 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 have to know where you are. You cannot afford to be lost or geographically misplaced. Especially especially when we're talking about artillery support. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because his job was to call in the artillery. Now, if I didn't have Russ pulling our bombardier with us, because he was always attached to our platoon or our company, we'd have Ziggy Sinclair, who was a corporal from the mortar platoon. He was a mortar fire controller. So either of those two guys... Or sometimes I'd do it myself, um, where I'd be the guy to call in and adjust fire, you know. But my sergeant and I could both do it, and that's why it was good having that second radio if we needed to, to flick to the gunner net. Yeah. So all this patrolling, um, we're in 1971, out in the jungles of Phuc Thuy province. The crescendo for all this for your experience in Vietnam is the Battle of Nui Lai, which we're going to get to in September 1971. But just talk us through some of the other uh, battles that you went through, some of the other contacts you had in your time out patrolling. Well, there were there were quite a few contacts, which were fleeting affairs. But, but the real um, ball grabber was uh, on the Song Ka. Song is Vietnamese for river, so the Ka River, up in the north of the province, we had been doing a mounted operation in the western side of the province and we got this call that the a 274 main force Viet Cong regiment were in the area and we were to go to the northern side of the Song Car and marry up and then sweep along from east to west on the northern side of the river while Bravo Company secured the southern bank of this this river. Uh, the river was only, you know, 15 metres wide. It wasn't a huge obstacle. You could get across it with a little bit of difficulty. But anyway, um, up until this was uh, June, um, late June, we we hadn't done anything with the tanks apart from the warm-up op. We'd worked with the APCs on a few ops, but nothing serious. And then all of a sudden... Um, we're on the northern side of the Song Car. We've been delivered there by our APCs who are going to a, uh, a little harbour at the back and then all of a sudden we hear the Centurion tanks coming and we're going to do a sweep with Centurion tanks. And luckily I had done some training with tanks in Australia but I was the only guy in the company who had done that. And uh, so I gave a quick burst on how to work with tanks and not get forward of the second road wheel and all the rest of it. And then the tank crew commanders very quickly assimilated with um, the guys that were on the ground and the idea was the tanks would hold back, then one of the platoons would lead out and we'd see if the enemy were there. My platoon was still sitting on the ground when, the, when this battle er- erupted and, I mean, from the amount of fire that was coming at us, we knew it was a big show. And what it was, was the headquarters and one of the units of 274 Regiment were dug in in bunkers, in a big X-shaped bunker system. And uh, they weren't going anywhere. Uh, and they were deliberately doing that to, to buy time for everyone else to get away. And so uh, the lead platoon uh, held their ground company commander said right we're going to do an assault we're going to do a formal company attack two platoons up one in depth into the bunkers uh, with the tanks in the assault now we'd never done this you know so we the tank guys just reminded us what we should and shouldn't do and how to talk to them on the tank telephone and blah 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 and away we went and my platoon was in depth right so it was two platoons forward and one in depth so everything in the shop window, and we're sweeping through. It says in the manual, um, it says in the training manual that when you're fighting through an objective, you should be able to do 100 metres in 15 minutes. Right? Well, we had to do about 250 metres, and it took us four hours. 
So it was intense, on your guts, tree stump to tree stump, log to log, point of cover to point of cover, fire and movement the whole time. How much fire was coming at you from oh, the heaps, shedful. Um, luckily, most of it high over our heads. And my platoon was in depth and we were watching the leaves 10 foot above us going ping, ping, ping. And then we thought, oh, shits of shots. You know, either that or they're downhill, you know. And um, and we thought we were going to have an easy run because we could hear the tanks and we weren't, we didn't have any grenades to clear the bunkers with because there'd been a screw-up in the uh, ordnance system and someone had mixed up instantaneous fuses with a seven-second delay, so we had no grenades. And so, just, um, so basically you mean that someone had made a mistake and guys were pulling the pins out of the grenades and the grenades were going off their hands. Yeah, and, but that happened in American and that's when they decided to pull all the grenades because we got all our ammo off them. Anyway, um, the fighting's getting really intense and uh, we saw one of the guys in the lead platoon, in 10 platoon, get hit. My medic went forward to help the stretcher bearer and... Um, but uh, Bernie was dead. He hit. He was hit with a twelve point seven or a fifty cal in the chest. He was dead before he hit the ground, um, which showed that you could not afford to stand up. You could not afford to stand up there. The enemy had cut fire lanes by stripping all the undergrowth up to knee knee height, um, and they were fighting from the bunker steps, the stairwells, or from behind the bunkers. They were firing everything and anything, and. Uh, then Templeton basically had the bulk of it and they ran out of ammo. So my platoon swept through and took over the assault from them. And then we started inching forward using fire and movement with the tanks. Um, if they located a bunker, they would fire a, a shell into it, lift the lid off if they could, and then go up and do a track turn on the bunker while we secured the flanks of the tank because they're quite vulnerable in the jungle. So this is really slow movement. And um, there are a couple of things that that happened. Um, I found out did if you don't want to have a got grenade, throw a claymore mine into a bunker, that'll work. And the other thing was uh, the tank telephone on the back. I, I needed to tell the, t- the crew commander where to fire his machine guns because there was an enemy machine gun shooting at us. And um, the thing was, it was a, it was a, an American M60 machine gun, and there was a lot of confusion because we thought one of the twelve platoon had swung around too far, but they were using a captured American gun anyway. So I got on the tank telephone, no answer. So I climb up on the back of the tank in the middle of this. Every bastard in the world shot at me, but I got him in the right direction, and they fired a canister round from the main armament. It's like a huge shotgun thing and blew a, uh, a 12.7 crew to bits and then the guys with the M60 got caught in the side of that and um, we then swept through and captured the machine gun back and and kept going. By last light, we'd secured the position and so we just went in all round defence. We'd lost one killed and four guys got wounded from our own artillery hitting the trees as it was going over our heads. So they just got shrap in the back of the legs. Nothing dangerous, uh, life-threatening. But uh, how many enemy died, we'll never know because they were buried literally in their bunkers. Um, we, we counted you know, at least half a dozen bodies in my area, if not more. But um, a lot of them were buried in those destroyed bunkers. They came back in the middle of the night, the enemy, to have a go, to try and recover something, but uh, the guard tanks fired canister and that changed their minds. Um, And then the next day, we did battlefield clearance and moved down. Let's move forward to September, Nui Lei. That was the big one. I mean, I think that was the, the last major action the Aussies were involved in during the Vietnam War, wasn't it? Yes, it was It was called Operation Ivanhoe. It was the very last operation before we withdrew out of Nui Dat, back to Vung Tau, and then back to Australia. So it's the last op. And the North Vietnamese, the 
the 33rd NVA Regiment had moved back into the area, probably with the intention of giving us one last kick up the bum before we left, you know, to try and embarrass us or inflict casualties or whatever. And so we were targeted. There was, they had a pretty good idea where they were on the eastern side of the province, up in the northern part, where they operated a lot in the past. And so we went out. And uh, on the day before, on the 20th of September, um, my platoon had uh, taken a resupply. We'd been out for about three weeks at that stage. We'd taken a resupply and we are moving out and we found a track going through the bush. And on that track, at least 200 enemy had moved and I only had my platoon with me, right? So this got our attention pretty smartly and I reported that. We had this track reporting system that we used. And then over to the west, 12 platoon found a similar track. So we were told to keep going. So I go a bit further north and in uh, the Nui Sao area, which is to the southwest, uh, southeast of Nui Lei. Nui Lei Nui means hill and it's just a small feature. And uh, we found another converging track, again, another 200 enemy. But the branches on each side of the track had been bent and broken, so you could tell they were carrying heavy equipment. So I reported this, and just as I was doing that, around the corner, along the track, wearing khaki chest webbing, green jungle boots, greens, pith helmets, comes a platoon of North Vietnamese, flat chat down the track. But we weren't on the track, we were alongside it, but I had a machine gun sighted there, so it was on. And we bowled about four of them over straight away, and then we're into it. And my platoon had kept that captured United States machine gun, and we carried it as our, what we call our floating gun. So I threw the floating gun across the track, established a fire base, and I did a left hook on the enemy. He did a right hook on me. And he was using a whistle blast like I used. I used to use whistle blast so people could hear it. So we bang, we ran to each other. No one was going to win there. So I pulled back. At this stage, Russ Pullen, my FOAC, is dropping artillery plus of the enemy to try and keep them locked in. We didn't know exactly how many, but we had a good feeling there was a couple of squads. I then did a right hook. He did a left hook. So... <laughs> So we, we snook at each other there. So I came back, I put a section each side of the track, told the grenadiers to load up, everyone to get their grenades ready. We all threw grenades and then we assaulted. And the enemy left. Now they left a few guys behind, dead, heavy blood trails, but they withdrew. And we just kept the artillery hammering into the bush each side of the track and plus of that. We then uh, came back. They were North Vietnamese. They were young guys between 17 and 19. Tropical ulcers, sores on their bodies. Um, but their their back little backpacks were all packed exactly the same with uh, their spare ammunition in oil skins. Their weapons were immaculate. Um, everything they did was as good as anyone you'd ever see. They were as competent, and then as aggressive as we were. But they didn't have that artillery support that we did. And I think that's probably why they thought, nah, we're not going to win this one. And also, that second gun in my initial contact, they must have thought, gee, this is a big group. And when that second gun opened up, they, I think they must have swung the pendulum a bit. Anyway, we uh, pulled back, um, redistributed ammunition, um, buried the enemy in a big shell crater and then the next morning moved off um, eating cold and then found the track heading north-west now and at that same time 12 platoon hit the enemy big time and uh, in that initial engagement Graham Spinkston's platoon lost um, Jimmy Duff killed and three or, three or four other guys wounded uh, when they ran into the corner of this bunker system. 
I'm over on the right and I'd found where this track had changed and it was now quite a highway going up towards where Spinkston's platoon was. And um, I was told, stay where you are until the other platoon sorts everything out. And when I was sitting there, I thought, the enemy know we're here. They must know we're here. So we put our claymores. Um, guys sorted out their ammunition, got their spare ammo, spare magazines ready. And then all of a sudden the enemy assaulted us out of the bush. Um, but I'd put out a bank of claymores and that broke up their assault. Um, we then moved only a couple of hundred metres so they wouldn't know where we were. And we just and we're in a really tight defensive position. But I had claymores out, another bank of claymores. I only had three banks, of each of six. And this time they assaulted where we were about half an hour later. And uh, so we got a monfilade. And then um, we withdrew, but we fired the claymores as we left rather than pick them up. And, because I was told, come into company headquarters now. So it was uh, single file, head down, ass up, and we joined company. We all then gathered at the at the base of the Nui Lay sort of feature, which was, we couldn't see it. We could only imagine it on the map. And uh, we were told, and there were aircraft flying around, there were enemy in there in large numbers. Up on the top of the Nui Lay feature, they had 12.7s in an anti-aircraft roll. And uh, the commanding officer... Um, at that stage, had already had Bravo Company in contact, then us, and then one of the villages up the road had been attacked. So there's everything's going on. So we, all of a sudden, air support returned to Fuktui Province, and we had people supporting us from all manner of area. And uh, so they started calling in artillery, big time, one five fives, one oh fives. Then the, Air, the American Air Force wanted to play, so they were sending in um, phantoms, F-4 phantoms, and they were dropping bombs. Um, and in front of my platoon, where we knew there were enemy, they dropped napalm about 75 metres out, uh, which is very frightening. And then the enemy was seen withdrawing over the Nui Lay feature. So about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we were told, right, assault this position. We didn't know the extent of it. And um, this was this was butterflies in your stomach time, more like wedge tail eagles, because we didn't know exactly what was there. But the pink teams, the American pink teams, it's a hundred killer team above us, were reporting hundreds of enemy withdrawing. And we thought, well, all we have to do is go through, bane at the wounded and be ours, you know, and that'll be it. But no. Um, my platoon was right forward platoon in an assault. We got no armour because that was all down in Vung Tau being shipped back to Australia. Thank you very much for whoever made that decision. So I've got Spinkston on my left, I'm on the right, come to headquarters, centre rear, 10 platoon at the back and away we go. We probably got about 50 metres in and we're on our guts. Well, we're pepper potting on our guts. Uh, using dry fire and movement because we weren't being engaged. And then all of a sudden, about 50 metres in, we found bunkers around us and signal wire and all that sort of stuff because it had been it had been hit with miniguns and rockets and Cobra gunships. So there was a fair bit of destruction everywhere. And then the noise erupted around. It must have been like the guys had at the battle a long time. It just was deafening. I had never heard noise like it. It was the whole area in front of my platoon opened up. It seemed like there were just, you know, hundreds of people in front of us. There weren't, but it seemed like that. But there were probably, we had about 100 men on the ground. I reckon there were probably four or 500, if not more, because it was a regiment there. And um, so we're, we're getting, we're heavily outnumbered. We've got the air and the arty, but you can't use the artillery when the air's there, so it's either or. But the artillery then starts doing fire mission danger close and walking back towards us as we're trying to make our way forward. Within 
the next, I don't know, half an hour of us trying to move forward, um, my right, my assault sections went really quiet. And you could not yell out to the man 10 metres away. He would not hear you. There were RPGs exploding in the trees above us. Lots of RPD fire, that's uh, Viet Cong machine gun fire. AKs, you name it. 12.7s. It was on. And um, I realised my machine guns weren't firing. I'd lost comms as well. My radio operator beside me had had um, his radio shot off his back, so he had to go and get the second radio. I had my hat shot off because it hit Barry in the face. Um, it was... I had to crawl forward and then kneel up behind a tree to find out what was going on, and I could see that my machine gunners were down behind the gun and not firing. At the same time, I could see further over, because it was slightly downhill, I could see the other machine gun team. And I couldn't yell out to anyone, because they couldn't hear me. And it was going to take too long to do anything. And then when I looked forward, I could see the enemy moving around in the distance. And this is only 75 metres away. I could see them getting ready to assault us, because there was no machine guns firing. So I... I just ran down to the machine gun and both machine gunners had been headshot. So I rolled them off the gun. I actually had to use their bodies as cover from fire because I was in an exposed position. Got the gun going and luckily at the same time, another one of my soldiers, um, Kevin Casson, he did the same thing. He ran forward. He got behind the other gun uh, where... Ralph Nibbler was mortally wounded and he managed to get the medic to come and drag Ralph back. And Kevin, nicknamed Fred, because we had so many Kevins in the platoon, his real name was, his, his platoon name was Fred. Fred and I, between us, got the guns going and then the word came back. Uh, Barry came down to where I was and he said, the boss says to withdraw back to his position because we couldn't make any progress. You were getting attacked during that phase. When oh, you said you got the guns going, you, yeah. the enemy was still assaulting. Oh, at, well, when we got the guns going, at that stage, the enemy had just come up, stood up, and we were basically shoulder to shoulder coming at us, firing from the hip. And as, uh, as some pundit once said, it became a target-rich environment. Um, and Fred and I just got stuck into these guys, and then that made them go to ground, and that stopped the effectiveness of their assault. Uh, we how, many, how many of them do you reckon got hit in that assault? Uh, probably a third. So there are at least 60 of them, I reckon, on our side. And they were doing the same over in front of 12, but they couldn't make any headway there because they were on a bit of an angle to them. So Fred and I then do that, and then we then did a – we'd never done this in training. We did a fighting withdrawal. So we basically fire and move backwards, and Fred and I – use the guns to cover people as the different groups moved. And then I'd yell out, go, Fred, and I'd, I'd cover him, and he'd go back 10 metres, plonk down. When I heard his gun go, I'd get up and move, and then that's how we pull back. So we then pull back into a firm uh, position. Um, the medics had taken Ralph back to a winch point, but he... he he died on the helicopter. He was the last Australian to die on active service. Um, we then, in Vietnam, we then uh, we were then told, right, they're going to call a B-52 strike in on this, so get the hell out of town. So the platoon was to withdraw, the company was to withdraw back about a kilometre, about a mile, a kilometre and a half, and go into a tight all-round defence. By now it's about five o'clock. We're losing light and um, I guess the worst part f at this stage for me was I could not recover my three dead that were still on the battlefield because to try and pick them men up, those men up and get backwards, you were going to go down. You, they were dead. There's no. I had their dog tags in my pocket, I left one on the body and I just couldn't do anything about it. 
So I had to make that decision to leave my men on the battlefield, which was pretty tough. But I couldn't do anything more for them. Um, so we, we, we fought our way back, got an all-around defence, and the company started pulling out. 10 platoon let out, then me, then 12 platoon. And uh, we'd redistributed the guns, we'd recovered the guns, which was the main thing. And as we withdrew south a kilometre and a half, <laughs> we withdrew in failing light into another bunker position. And the enemy didn't know we were there. And uh, someone said, oh, they heard noise as we were going around. And as I led my platoon around to, to form the tight platoon uh, company perimeter, um, uh, Bob Sims, a young rifleman from Western Australia, he saw these guys 25 metres away <laughs> sitting on a bunker having their dinner on the roof of their bunker, eating with chopsticks. So he dropped onto one knee. He was carrying Nibs's gun. He stitched them up and it was on. All of a sudden, the whole area around the company erupted. And so we were on three sides, we were surrounded. And so from one side of the company perimeter to the other, it was only about 70 metres tops. So the mission then was to just keep the perimeter tight, have the guys in pairs, and... Don't fire until someone's right in front of you because we're getting low on ammo. We'd already gone in that day. I'd already had one resupply of ammunition by the commanding officer by free drop chopper. We'd already gone through three first lines of ammo in in that one day. So Daryl's running around making sure everyone's got that. Then he got hit through the arm uh, while he was laying down um, behind a tree, he got hit in the arm and he couldn't fire his rifle. So um, uh, he was wounded beforehand, sorry. And so he, he's he gone. i got no sergeant at that stage. So I'm running around doing all that. And uh, then there was someone shooting into the platoon You because the enemy used green tracer, whereas we used red. You could see the green tracers zinging into the area. And um, I kept on calling out to the guys, don't fire back until you've got a, a target right in front of you. And because uh, we had no claymores, I think we only had six left. And uh, But we've got our grenades and we've got um, about half the first line of ammo left. And uh, what we didn't realise, this guy was actually up in a tree shooting in. And every time I said something, he'd shoot at my tree. And then, um, then I heard a bang. And I thought an RPG had hit the tree that I was using for cover. But the bang, in actual fact, was uh, two AK-47 bullets ripping into my left shoulder, which totally destroyed my left shoulder, dislocated what was left of my arm at the top of the arm. And um, one bullet stopped under my nipple. The other one skipped off my scapula and out the back and tore a big hole in my back. And uh, after issuing the appropriate expletive, my stretcher bearer came forward and then he grabbed hold of my webbing and he dragged me back into company headquarters. I then left the platoon in charge with the bombardier in charge of it so we didn't have to reshuffle the sections. So I said, Russ, you know what's got to go on. Just keep the artillery adjusted where you need it. The forward observer captain in company headquarters was doing most of that. So Russ um, became a platoon commander for the night and the other guys just stayed awake all night, wait. And doing that. About nine o'clock, the artillery stopped because then, once the artillery stopped, then the enemy stopped and they withdrew. They just hugged our bill, as they say, until the artillery stopped. And that was on fire mission danger close until nine o'clock. That was really, you know, artillery only 30, 40 metres away is bloody close. Anyway, I'm back in, uh, in company headquarters. The medic. Uh, Mick O'Sullivan, a corporal, medical corps, um, asked me what happened. I said, I think I got hit with an RPG or something, because I had no idea. And he starts checking me and he said, what's that? And so we felt one of the bullets under my nipple. Anyway, I said, I'm really wet around the back of my shirt. So he went, and he ripped the shirt open and he went, oh, fuck, which is not good for your morale. And I said, what? He said, oh, you got a big hole in your back. And I was thinking, oh, one of my diggers has shot me in the back, you know. 
But he said, no, no, it's an exit wound. And I went, really? He said, yeah. And, and Mick saved my life by sitting up all night and pressing shell dressings to stop me bleeding to death. So I had to sit up all night because I couldn't lay down. I just bled too much with Mick applying this compression onto my, uh, this huge exit wound in my back. Anyway, um, next morning, um, the Kiwis, Victor Company, had been told to come and reinforce us, which they did, and uh, they swept around the area, secured it, and then about nine o'clock I got choppered out because they couldn't get a chopper in until then. And uh, um, then, 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 they, then they went out and they recovered my three dead who hadn't been touched. Um, and the Kiwis did something really nice. Um, as, as my guys carried their stretchers, carried them out on their stretcher frames to the chopper pad, I didn't see this, but I was told later, the, the New Zealand soldiers uh, gave them a salute, gave them a, a rifle salute as they carried their bodies out, which was really nice. Um, and that was really the last major battle of the war. We ended up uh, that day, we lost, um, in our company, uh, four killed and about seven or eight wounded and in Bravo Company no one was killed but about 19 wounded in and yeah it was 60 mil mortars so it was a big day for the battalion um, but that was the last major engagement of the war um, um, my sergeant made a good recovery uh, I took about a year it took me a year in hospital to get put back together and that was it so more time in hospital than you'd spent in country in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, but but I came, became very good at playing 500. Very good. Yeah, I did actually, yeah. I mean, it's a... Uh, I mean, give, as you gave that account, I, I've been through the whole gamut of emotions. There was chuckles there in the, in the humorous bits. I had shivers up my spine at times, a few yeah. tears. I mean, it's just such a gripping account. What's... How do you look back on it now? What's your feeling when you look back on the war? And I mean, you sit here and you tell these stories and, you know, I've heard you tell other people. How do you look back on the war now? How do I look back on it? Well, I look back on um, the efforts of my platoon with great pride. Um, I'm so proud of them because not one of us thought we were going to come out that night alive. Not one of us. But their battle discipline... um, for example, remember I said when the enemy were coming towards us and they were assaulting us earlier in the battle, I said nobody is to shoot until I fire the claymores. And we waited until they were within 20 metres, maybe 15 metres of us. We could see their faces as clear as day, but they just couldn't see us through the bush. And not one man broke. And they waited because then the claymores had the maximum effect. We got them standing up. And so, and the way that they fought when we were in real trouble in later in the battle, you know, when the assault ground to a halt because of just sheer numbers, um, everyone was looking after each other. Everyone was doing, there weren't any crazy bursts of fire. I could hear the guys with the M16s just only firing one or two shots at a time, just double tapping. And no one was just going bang, 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 bang with single shot from the SLR. Everyone was watching their ammunition, observing. They were trying to communicate to each other. And when we did our fighting withdrawal, which we'd never done in training, um, the guys were good. They, you could, they were all working together. Um, so I look upon that with great pride. The way they conducted themselves... Um, on and off the battlefield was always something I was very proud of. The, the way they patrolled, the way they moved, their battlecraft, their fieldcraft, they're all things you couldn't have asked for any better. You know, they, they did their job so well. I look back on the whole war as um, a terrible waste of lives on all sides. It was a war that I think could have been avoided uh, if the French had done the right thing back in 1947. Um, but they didn't, as they normally do. Um, 
because it really was a civil war. It was a war of nationalism. Uh, it's just that Ho Chi Minh used communism as his vehicle to get support, and it worked. Um, they defeated one of the greatest nations on earth uh, on the battlefield. When I say defeated, it, that was more a war of political attrition than anything else. Um, but um, I've since met the enemy uh, that I fought against and uh, we get on like a house on fire because we were just guys doing our job. No animosity, no anger, no angst because as one Viet Cong guy said to me, um, you buried our dead, you took care of our wounded, you tried to do something for the people of Phuc Thuy and you did not commit atrocities. And and that's why we we get accepted the way we are when we go back as, as veterans. Um, but, I mean, God, how many other wars in this world could have been avoided if people had done the right thing? If it hadn't been for economics and greed and religion and a whole bunch of other things. But that's the way I look at it. Gary, it's been extraordinary. Thank you so much. It's been just a just such a wonderful insight into uh, into this time in your life, and and I know not always easy for you to talk about. So I really appreciate. It. I'm sure everyone listening here really appreciates this rare insight uh, into these experiences that you had. And so, um, thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Thank you for having me. 